Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Becoming a Bible Nerd. It's been a long time since we've gotten together, so I'm so excited about this morning. So while people are logging on, I am just going to kind of go over some things that I try to always go over with study Bibles and stuff like that. So if you are new to joining, you need to get a good study Bible that has this commentary and maps and stuff at the bottom. There's all different versions. There's all different kinds. And so it's always good when you're reading to have notes at the bottom that kind of explain the culture and what's going on, gives you maps and good stuff like that so you can understand a little bit more. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see y'all. Um, another thing that I encourage people to get is a commentary, which is basically a book of all the notes that are written at the bottom of the Bible so they can elaborate, they can put a little bit more in there. And um, of course, uh, I've always said that I started with Bible knowledge commentary and then I've just kind of grown since um, studying into um, using other um, books, but that's a good place to start. Also, if you are more intellectual and want to read more um, information, like that's not enough for you, you can go to um, if you Google Dr. Constable's notes, he's a seminary professor that puts all of his commentary notes online, and you can print that out, or you can order it in a bound book form. So, um, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. I'm just going to warn you, this is a background. So, we will look at some scripture um, outside of Ephesians, but we are going to just talk about the background of Ephesus. And if I lose you, please don't um, shy away from coming back next week because we'll dig into the scriptures then. But we need to know that and understand and get a grasp of what's going on in the city because that's going to help us make much more sense of the text whenever we dig in next week. So hang in there with me. We're going to get started. I included a map yesterday on the website. So I'm hoping if you haven't gotten a chance that you'll go back to the map and click on it. And you'll see where Ephesus is. If you look at modern day Turkey, it is on the far west side um, and it is a coast, um, it's on the coast, it's a harbor city or it was a harbor city. People aren't really inhabiting Ephesus anymore. It's just a bunch of archeological um, excavations. It's really a big site to visit, a lot to see, a lot of cool things there. But this was a harbor city back in its day. The word Ephesus means desirable. So that's going to give you a hint of what this city is going to be like. I think this is interesting, so I'm including it. Legend, Greek mythology legend. So if you're into your Greek mythology, you're going to say, I already knew this. Um, that is something I didn't pay that close attention to in school, so I'm learning as I study. But Greek mythology legend tells us that the Amazons founded um, Ephesus in 19. 100 BC. Now this is cool to me that these Amazons were a tribe of warriors. They only um, would procreate to create, I'm sorry, tribe of war warrior women. They would only procreate to produce other women. They would only keep the girls and they would raise them to be archers and they were fierce warriors. And this um, tribe of Amazon women started this mother goddess cult called Sybil. They worshipped this um, little idol and she was the mother goddess and eventually Sybil became known as um, Artemis. And um, Kathy, if you're listening, if you'll shut your door because I can hear an echo of my voice and it's distracting me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have ADD and um, I can hear my voice on the other part of the house and uh, <laughs> it's There she went. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so Artemis is the goddess. Um, it's a Greek goddess, and she's the goddess of fertility and hunting. A lot of times in Greek mythology, you'll see her wearing a, a dress, and she has a bow and arrow, and maybe she's surrounded by deer. Um, she's the twin sister of Apollo, daughter of Zeus. She's believed to have been born right, well, the Ephesians believe that she was born right outside of Ephesus on a little island called Artigia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which was nicknamed Herodicio. And so here we have our first counterfeit that we're going to talk about um, in this book. Satan always wants um, to counterfeit what God had. He had Eve in Eden, they had, which was paradise, they have Artemis in Herodicio. 
And so Satan is always coming in and confusing people and counterfeiting um, the truth. And so in Greece, the archer Artemis was um, usually worshipped as a secondary goddess, but in Ephesus, she rose to prominent deity, and she was known as Artemis of the Ephesians. And so whenever you heard that, there was a distinction. Their statues of Artemis were much more ornate. It wasn't just a girl in a dress with a bow and arrow. I put a picture of one that had been excavated in um, Ephesus up on the site, so you can take a look at that. But they made her much more royal, and she rose to prominent deity. Um, I'm going to read a little section in Acts chapter 19. A lot of you that have gone through Acts, you're going to remember this. I'm just reading it to jog your memory. So Paul is in Ephesus, and and there's a lot of, um, I'm jumping around here, but there's 14 other deities that have been found and identified in uh, pagan temples in Ephesus. So they're worshiping all kinds of gods and goddesses. It's just they're putting Artemis at the top. But because of that, um, Artemis was the, I mean, I'm sorry, Ephesus was the center for magical practices. And so when Paul goes in Ephesians, he ends up preaching one day, and people are coming and bringing out all their magical spells and um, their sorcery tools, and they burn it. And it ended up being close to $2 million today of um, stuff that was burned. And so God is moving through here. Uh, people are repenting, and lots of changes are happening. And so in chapter 19, verse Let's see where I'm going to start. I'm going to start in verse 23 of Acts. I'm going to recall what happens after all of this magical stuff is burnt up. People that have their livelihood in Ephesus get threatened. And it says, um, I'm sorry, just lost my place again. Okay, when, uh, 23. During that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. For a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, Men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You both see and hear that not, um, that not only in Ephesus, but all over Asia, this man Paul persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hands are not gods. And so Demetrius is making these small souvenir Artemises that that people can, when they come to the temple, they can buy and they can lay them at her feet or they can bring them home to family members because Artemis worship in Ephesus is so big that they earned this title called Neochorus and it's the temple keepers for the goddess of Artemis. So all over the world, wherever she is worshipped, everyone knows that Ephesus is the temple keeper and they built a temple for her. I posted a replica of what it would have looked like. We didn't get to go and see. They said there's only about two columns left um, today. But there were 127 columns in her temple. Um, it took 220 years to construct this. Whenever you go to these ruins and you walk up to one of these columns, I stood at the base of one at another site, and you look up, it's as far as the eye can see. I can't imagine how many stories up. Carrie Prowse probably has that in her notes. but. It, you just look straight up to get to the top of it. So these columns are massive, and there's 127 of them, and it took 220 years to build. They said that this temple was four times the Parthenon in Athens, and that is a very famous structure. Because of it, this massive structure, this temple in Ephesus became known uh, as one of the seven wonders of the world. So this was huge, and because of that, people all over Asia would travel to Ephesus to make a pilgrimage once a year. Just like Jews would go to the temple in Jerusalem several times a year, um, faithful Artemis followers would come in, and I think it was probably something just, just to sightsee. It was the most beautiful thing that people can imagine. And so they're coming in, they're shipping, you know, on ships into the harbor, going to see this, and so the Agora, or the shops on the main street, are just littered with idols that you could purchase, and that's how these people made their livelihood. So Demetrius is mad, and he talks to all of the other shopkeepers, and he's getting them fired up. And so I want to jump ahead real quick, and um, he ends up um, leading a group of people into the theater, and they're all yelling, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. 
And then in verse 34, it says, But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they united a cry that went up for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So for two hours, there was a riot in the theater about Artemis because they were mad that Paul was coming in and threatening their way of life because people were turning to Christ. I just want you to take a second and get your mind wrapped around this. I don't think I've ever gone anywhere and passionately cheered for two hours straight in something that I believe in. These people believed in what they were fighting for, and it was extremely important to them. And Artemis was huge in this culture. And so um, we are going to, whenever we're studying in Ephesus, we are going to be having to remember that this is always a war between the Christians and the people that are, um, there's tension, let me say that, instead of a war, there's tension between the Christians and people that are worshiping Artemis. And a lot of times you wouldn't be able to trade in the shops if you didn't pay homage to whatever God was um, predominant in the city. So just keep that tucked away. Um, a few other facts about Ephesus. Let's see. It was. It ended up rising to be the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. So this was a huge city. People knew about it from all over the world. Um, it was the slave trade capital of the world. So it was made up of 40% slaves. And the slaves would come from other countries that Rome was fighting against. And they would send some to Rome. And they would send some to Ephesus. And these uh, people would work in the houses of uh, the wealthy. Uh, they would work in the brothels. They would work in gladiator um, fights, um, wherever there was a need. But 40% of the population was slaves. And they had something called infant exposure. And this just breaks your heart. Um, in the Roman culture, the dad, the father of the family, has all power. He can do or say anything he wants with no restrictions except he cannot sleep with a married woman. He can do anything to anyone but a married woman. And so um, a lot of times he can make the decision when a woman had her baby that he didn't want it. Maybe they already had enough girls or maybe there was just a little something um, physically uh, wrong with the child. And so it was legal to have them dumped in nature or the agora, which was the marketplace. And so there were babies here that would be immediately after they were born kind of sent into the slave trade industry. And so a lot, there's going to be a few times that we talk about adoption in here. And just keep that in mind because the Christians are going to be the ones that go and take care of these babies and adopt them and to prevent them from getting sold into the slave trade. So just lots going on in this city. We're going to visit for just another minute about who all has lived here that we have studied. We've gone through uh, Matthew and then Acts, um, Colossians, First and Second Timothy. And um, so we have met some of these people along the way. And so it's just neat to see who all has made a difference in the people that we studied. So Paul meets Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth. And in Acts 18, he leaves them in Ephesus. He drops them off there. He goes along his way. And that's when Priscilla and Aquila meet Apollos, who is a disciple traveling through, evangelizing. And he's the one that only knows of John's baptism. And they said, oh, you don't know the baptism of the Spirit? So they end up discipling Apollos there in Ephesus. We know that Paul's there for years. I think it's up to three years. At one point, he rents a lecture hall, Tyrannius's lecture hall. And he, he preaches there or teaches there for uh, two years. We had all this drama with um, Demetrius and the, uh, the, idol, the idol maker. And so we know that he was there for, it looks like, up to three years. We also know that Paul's traveling companions are there because in this big riot, they go in to try to calm the crowd. And it's Gaius and um, Aristarchus. Uh, these names I can butcher pretty well. Uh, also... Timothy, we know that he is there because while Paul is in prison, he writes letters to Timothy. We studied him, and Timothy was heading up the church in Ephesus. So those letters are to him to instruct him on how to lead well in Ephesus. And then we know that Tychicus was there. He is mentioned here, there, and everywhere. Almost in every book, you see a little mention of him. So whenever you read it in and of itself, you think, who is this guy? I don't know anything about him. 
but he is one of the traveling companions of Paul. We know that he travels um, from Corinth to Jerusalem when Paul has collected money to give um, the Jerusalem um, council a gift. We know that he's with, prison, with Paul in prison. We know that he's the letter carrier of this letter to the Ephesians. He's going to be the one that carries it to him and reads it to them. Um, he travels with Onis Onesimus, which was um, the letter to Philemon, was about a slave that had run away and had kind of joined up with Paul. And so Philemon is about um, Paul writing him a letter saying, hey, you need to take your slave back and not be cruel to him. And so we see them traveling together. And also we know that he sends Tychicus um, to free up Titus and Timothy at one point when he wants these two guys to, to go and comfort him in prison. Um, it is Tychicus that is going to run the church while they're out. So I think that's just some cool facts, some um, interesting things that we see these minor figures of the Bible, but they're doing mighty things for the kingdom. Uh, also, we know that, uh, oh, and I just wanted to mention that we just see here that Paul is fulfilling the Great Commission. All of these people that are named are people that he's discipled, and these are people that are just making an impact in Ephesus. There are other, many other people that he's discipled that are in other places, but these people, these strong men and women of God are in Ephesus making a difference. And then we know that John ends up here, um, John the Apostle. He ends up, um, a, some church documents believe that he wrote um, the Gospel of John while he was in Ephesus. It is um, believed that he brought Mary, the mother of Jesus, with him to live there because he was left to care for her. And John really becomes the leader of this Christian community after Paul's death. And so we believe he wrote Ephesus. Um, we believe that, I mean, I'm sorry, we believe he wrote the Gospel of John while in Ephesus. We believe that John died there. And he also wrote on the Isle of Patmos a letter in Revelation to Ephesus. And so I'm going to leave you today by reading that letter. These letters that are written, a lot of the church letters in the Old Te or the New Testament, they were not meant just for that one city, but they're called circulating letters. They were meant to go to all the ch home churches in the surrounding towns. And so some things that you might have read preparing for this said that the earliest church documents didn't have Ephesians written in this. They don't know necessarily if it was exactly a letter to the Ephesians, but what they do know is it was a letter written to the people in that region, and the Ephesus church was the largest church, and so scholars do believe that this was, it originated by being read to the Ephesians, but then it circulated around to all the other home churches in the surrounding areas. But I'm going to um, end today with um, reading the letter to Ephesus from John in the book of Revelation, and we'll just end there. I want you to begin studying chapter 1 next week. I'm not sure if we'll get through it all in one week. Every single verse is so rich in theology that we might just take our time and divide it up into two weeks. In fact, I can say that we probably will do that. So I'm going to go ahead and read Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walk among the seven golden menorahs. So this is the word um, God gave this message to Jesus, who ended up giving it to an angel, who ended up giving it to John. And this is the letter, For I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. So I want you to think about that. God is commending them on their deeds, their hard work, and that they persevered. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Remember, 1 Timothy was full of teachings on what to do with false teachers. So that's a problem. People are going in. They look like Christians. They kind of have a message that sounds like Christians, but the theology is off. And Timothy was warned to expose them. Um, you have persevered and you have endured hardship for my name and you have not grown weary. They had been faithful for 40 years at this point of spreading the gospel and holding the church up and keeping it strong. Then the word of the Lord says, yet I have this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. 
Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the deeds you did at first. They had forgotten or they had lost their love. They had gotten so into the theology, which is important. That's something that God had instructed them to do in earlier letters, but that they lost their love. And so he's saying that we have to remember our first love. So today, if you're going through anything, there are three, three um, steps that we have here that Jesus gave the church of Ephesus of what he wanted them to do. And so we can learn from these. He wants us to remember from where they had fallen, remember that they had love, and now they were just going through the motions. He wanted them to repent. Repent means to return to the path. So somewhere they took a wrong turn, and he's saying, hey, come back to the original path um, and return to what you first did. And so I'll just encourage you that today. If you've blown it, if you've made mistakes, God is just saying, remember where you came from, repent from where you are, and return to where you originally are. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your menorah from its place. Um, and basically, uh, when I was in um, doing this lesson in Ephesus, um, our God summed it up is that theology is important, but love and meeting needs of the hurting is most important. It ends with saying, but you have this in your favor. You ha hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To those who are victorious, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That was a message. It's not an Artemis' paradise. But if you are victorious, you will get to eat in the paradise of God. So this is going to be a fun letter. Hopefully I have a lot of pictures so that you can get a visual. Stay with me. Thank you this morning for talking about all of this background stuff. I know it can get bogged down and maybe uh, monotonous, but you stuck with it. And so we'll dig into the scriptures. I can't wait to learn what you, some of you guys are hearing. So please share that with me. I will see you next week. Happy reading.